Can the most common decoupling strategy actually be the worst? One that creates more noise instead of less? I fell into the trap too for much of my 30 year career, until I uncovered the proven method that reduces supply ringing and noise, improves RF performance and even reduces your bill of material. In this video I'm going to show you how straightforward it is to go from this to this and I'll show you exactly how you can do this yourself. So in order to understand what's going on, we first have to look at capacitor models. <sighs> this is what you get when you ask AI for help. Let me do it myself again. This is a simplified model for a capacitor. It's an RLC series network. Now, if you want to do simulations with this, you will need the values of these components. But where do you find those? Almost all manufacturers of passive components have model parameters on their website. I'll show you the one from Murata. I'm not sponsored here. It's called SimSurfing. You can go to the website, I'll leave the link in the description, and you can select all the capacitor parameters like capacitance, voltage, type of dielectric, and package size. You are then presented with this list. If you select one of these line items and press frequency characteristics, and then Z absolute, you get the impedance graph for this capacitor. From this graph, you can get the resonance frequency, the series resistance, which is the lowest point of the dip, and the inductance. You have to calculate the inductance yourself using the LC resonator formula where F is the resonance frequency and C is the value of the capacitor. Here you see a set of model parameters I got using SimServing. What is crucial to notice here is that the larger the capacitor value, the lower its resonance frequency, also called the self-resonance frequency or SRF in datasheet. An important side note is that you only see 0805 capacitors in this video. If you make capacitors physically smaller, like 0402, the resonance frequency will go up. If you make them physically bigger, like a 1206, the resonance frequency will go down. Another key understanding is the behavior versus frequency. Below the resonance frequency, this model behaves like a capacitor. Exactly at the resonance frequency, the inductor and capacitor cancel each other out completely and the model behaves like a perfect resistor. Above the resonance frequency, the model behaves like an inductor. If this is the first time you see this theory, this might come as a surprise to you. A capacitor behaving like an inductor? Now it's crucial to realize it only behaves like an inductor. The impedance increases with frequency in the inductive region. However, it won't short your supply like a real inductor and it will still be a good decoupling device since the impedance is very low because the inductance is very low. One thing to keep in mind is that this is a very simplified model. If you look at a 100 nanofarad capacitor, for instance, you see multiple resonances. The model only has a single resonance, so it's not super accurate. It is, however, good enough to get an insight into the behavior of decoupling networks. Now that you see how capacitors secretly change personality with frequency, how do you know if your decoupling network is helping you or sabotaging you? Let's find out. The whole idea of decoupling supplies is to create a very low supply impedance over a wide frequency range and you use capacitors to do that because they form a short circuit for higher frequencies and have infinite resistance at DC, so they don't short your supply. The most common way to do that is the circuit you see here. The idea behind this approach is that each capacitor deals with a certain frequency range. The common belief is that small values are good for decoupling high frequencies and larger values are good for low frequencies. Now let's use the capacitor model parameters you just found to find out if this is actually true. Here you see a simulation schematic of four parallel capacitors with the accurate models you found in a 50 ohm system. I've chosen a 50 ohm system so I can actually measure this in reality as well. The schematic uses 100 pico, 1 nano, 10 nano and 100 nano for at capacitors in parallel. The way this simulation works is very simple. If the impedance of the decoupling network is low, meaning it decouples well, this circuit will have more loss which we can see in the simulation results. I also made a small PCB that has this exact configuration. It's a transmission line with connectors on both ends and a part in the middle where components can be placed between the transmission line and the ground. There's a lot of via stitching to make sure the ground is as good as it can be, also for very high frequencies. I measured this board with a nano VNA and a nano VNA saver software which runs in Python. So here you see the results of the simulation and the measurements. They're actually pretty close, especially when you consider I did not use Murata capacitors, but capacitors with similar voltage, dielectric, size and value from an unknown source. I made my capacitor bin about 20 years ago and have no idea which brand I bought back then. I also mentioned before that the models are a pretty rough approximation of reality. Now this is just one of dozens of problems that can sneak into your designs. Over my 30 years, I've catalogued at least 60 of these and built a complete system to help avoid them. I put that system into a course. You can watch a free one hour module and grab my electronics product development checklist. Links are in the description. Now here's the crazy part. This decoupling strategy you thought was helping you was actually making things worse. 
Let me show you. First of all, you see a number of high peaks, which is not what you want for good decoupling. These are caused because a larger value capacitor has gone into its inductive region, while a lower value capacitor still is in its capacitive region. These two in parallel form a parallel LC resonator. So why are parallel resonators a problem? Well, they cause ringing in your supply if you apply a load peak to it. I'll show some simulations on this ringing later in the video. This ringing means your digital logic might glitch randomly if it gets really bad. Imagine debugging that for days, only to discover it was your capacitor choice. You also get a higher noise level in your supplies at these resonance frequencies. So you can see it's pretty much unwanted. Another important factor is capacitor placement. The common theory is that smaller capacitor values are better for RF. If you follow that theory, then you would place these as close as possible to a power supply pin of an IC, so the highest frequency can follow the shortest possible loop. That's what almost everyone believes. Let's analyze this theory by looking at the models. So the smallest capacitor actually has the highest series resistance, 140 milliohms for 100 picofarad versus 18 milliohms for 100 nanofarad. If you look at the inductance, the 100 nanofarad is better than the 100 picofarad as well. So what this means is that you have to mirror the whole structure. The 100 nanofarad should be closest to the pin for good RF decoupling and preventing interference. It goes against decades of textbook wisdom, but the truth is unavoidable. Larger value SMD capacitors are actually slightly better for RF. Keep in mind that this only holds true when you stay within the same package size. A smaller package will result in a lower RF impedance, a larger package will result in a larger RF impedance. So the very common approach has some serious drawbacks. The placement is wrong, but even if you fix that, you're still left with a noisy, ringing power supply. The question is, can you use the knowledge you have now to solve all this and reduce your bill of material at the same time? Let's find out. But first, you need to understand another critical piece of theory that will help you come up with a better solution, and that's the Q factor. So a capacitor is basically a series resonator. The Q factor tells you how good the resonator is at resonating. If it's very good at resonating, you can get really high peaks in your decoupling impedance. So how do you calculate Q? Well. This is the formula. So if you wanted to reduce Q, you could make the inductance smaller, make the capacitance bigger, or make the resistance bigger. If you look at the total Q formula and compare 100 nanofarad versus 100 picofarad, 100 nanofarad has a much lower Q. The capacitance is 1000 times bigger, the inductance at high frequencies is lower, and the resistance is around 8 times smaller. If I'm not making any calculation errors, that results in a 4.2 times lower Q factor of the component itself. But how do you prevent those very annoying parallel resonances? Remember those capacitive and inductive regions from the beginning of this video? If you were to use multiple larger value capacitors with the same value in parallel, all capacitors would transform from their capacitive to inductive region at the same time, completely eliminating these nasty parallel resonances. Any kind of parallel resonance that you may still get in combination with other parts on your PCB will be lower because the larger capacitance causes a lower Q overall. You'll still be left with a one very big series resonance, but that causes a dip instead of a bump, which does not bother us because this does not cause ringing or noise bumps in the supply. And that's not the end of the advantages. Using a single or multiple larger valued capacitors also increases the local energy storage of your supply, making your supply far more robust for load peaks. This all sounds too good to be true, so let's verify it with measurements and simulations. Here you see the simulation model, four 100 nanofarad capacitors in parallel. The measurement setup is the same as before, just with different capacitors mounted of course. This plot shows the result of the simulation and the measurement. As you can see, considering the primitive models, the simulation is quite well in line with the measurement. The measurement is 5 dB lower at high frequencies, showing that the actual capacitors are a bit better there than the simple model. As you can see, all big bumps are eliminated. There are some resonances near the dip, this is due to the component tolerances, these capacitors are not very accurate with their capacitance value. Because of this, the resonances of the four capacitors don't line up perfectly, creating parallel resonators, which are not a problem since they are very deep. I also mentioned the supply ringing. I don't have good enough equipment to measure that, but you can do a simulation. Here you see the results with the original network of 100 pico, 1 nano, 10 nano and 100 nano and 4 times 100 nanofarad. As you can see, the common network has ringing, which is completely absent in the improved decoupling approach. You can also see the voltage drop is less, showing the bigger local energy storage capacity of the four 100 nanofarad capacitors. I was also curious what 4 times 1 microfarad would do. 
That also looks quite good. A 1 microfarad capacitor is only 30% more expensive than a 100 nanofarad capacitor to get 10 times the energy storage. This is great if you want a quiet supply or if you absolutely need this because your supply needs to deal with heavy transients. Here you see an overview of all strategies. Using multiple larger values clearly is better than the classic decoupling strategy. If you want decoupling to start at its lowest possible frequency, you can use 4 times 1 microfarad. Just pay attention, if you do not use 0805 components, you'd have to do a simulation of your own with the models for those components. At different component sizes, the behavior will be slightly different. Using larger values will still be advantageous though. So by using multiple capacitors with a larger value, you reduce the Q factor, create a single series resonance instead of multiple parallel resonances, you prevent high impedance bumps in the supply, reducing noise and ringing, and your supply becomes much more stable due to the larger local energy storage. The other big advantage, you can throw two or three items out of your bill of material, which is great for production. Each line item you can throw out is a bonus. If you'd like to see more examples like this and avoid at least 60 other hidden pitfalls, I've got a course. You can watch a free one hour course module and get a free checklist. Links are in the description. The last strategy is probably good enough for almost all designs, but what if you wanted even more? The best possible decoupling strategy where you go from this to this. Let me show you why there are advantages to this, how to achieve them and when you may want to use this. Up till now, we've looked at a few capacitors placed very close to each other. In reality, however, you have PCB traces connecting those capacitors or groups of capacitors. These traces have inductance. The problem that can occur is that this inductance, in combination with the extremely low impedance of large value decoupling capacitors, can create new unwanted parallel resonances. So how do you counter that? Well, you make your capacitors worse. This sounds very counterintuitive, but for applications where power supply noise and ringing is absolutely critical, this may be what you have to do. The way you make your capacitors worse is by adding a small series resistor, smashing the Q factor. The big advantage of this is that you've introduced damping for any kind of resonance that may occur. It's like an insurance policy that protects you no matter what happens on your PCB. Now the bigger the resistors, the better the damping, but the higher the impedance of your supply, so you don't want to make them too big. So in an actual design, you may have to simulate what the best value for these resistors would be. Here you see the simulation schematic with 1 ohm resistors in series with 4 100 nanofarad capacitors. And here you can see the results of that simulation and of a measurement that I did. You can see a very smooth line versus frequency thanks to the damping resistors. It's really nice to compare this response with the original response using 100 pico, 1 nano, 10 nano and 100 nanofarad. Here you see the difference. On average, it is following the original circuit, but without the big peaks and dips, and it's better at high frequencies even with the series resistors. This solution is a bit more expensive and takes more board space. So you should only consider this for really critical applications where supply noise is crucial, you have really large low transients or both at the same time. I never needed to resort to this strategy yet. In any case, with the information in this video, you now have all the tools at your disposal to analyze your own decoupling networks and optimize them for your own applications. Now for a different subject. Did you know that resistors can actually ruin your distortion? If you want to learn how to prevent that, Check out this video. See you next time.